is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, the live action Netflix series, season one, episode seven The Girl with the Sawfish Tattoo. In this episode, we get the iconic moment of Luffy giving Nami his straw hat to wear while he gathers his friends to kick some ass. I am very, very here for it. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Gabby for commissioning this episode. You guys, I'm so bummed. One episode left after this. I am so sad. <laughs> this has been such fun. I, like, I really, really want them to just keep making this show in perpetuity, like the anime. Tighten everything up. Do whatever you need to do. I'm fine with that. But I really want to be watching this series 10 years from now with like new episodes coming out. You know, that's I, I hope so much that they don't cancel it in the way that Netflix does. I know they've already, you know, greenlit a second season, but that's no guarantee of anything. And I just... I'm desperately keeping my fingers crossed and hoping. And uh, I don't think that they have anything like a drop date for season two. I think it's just been announced that they are starting on filming. But hopefully one of y'all will commission me to watch that too. I really hope. So we'll see. Um, but let's begin. Let's begin. Okay. I just want to acknowledge too that I love the title of this episode, The Girl with the Sawfish Tattoo, as clearly a reference to The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And, you know, she does have a pretty traumatic history. It's granted not quite on the level of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but uh, we're, we're, I, I appreciate that little joke. It's pretty good. So we start the episode off with Buggy directing Usopp and... I can't with how much Buggy says shit and shit-tastic. I think he called them shittiots uh, last episode. But he is just mocking Usopp here for not knowing which direction is starboard. And he says something like, I thought clowns are supposed to be funny. And Buggy says, want to say that to my face? And then Zoro rounds the corner. And he says, I know Luffy made a deal with you, but if you trick us and Buggy says, what are you going to do? Bleed on me? Which, uh, that's a Monty Python line, but also, sir, you are only a head. Like you have, you, you have no body. You are not in any position to be making threats against the guy standing with a sword at his hip, a hip that he has because he has a whole body. I would just advise not, but Buggy isn't really thinking things through. So Zoro picks him up by his little uh, hair cover. What do you call that? A handkerchief, I guess, and hangs him over the side. And he just is like, well, you know, Zoro, buddy, we're cool. Everything's fine, right? And then he starts singing this song. Oh, there once was a girl with tangerine hair. Stole my map and left me stranded somewhere. Truly a crafted and crooked young lass, but you can't deny she had a spectacular... Oh, God, right on my nose. <sighs> Look, I don't like Buggy, but she do have an ass, though. You got to give it to her. Um, so then we cut over to Luffy, who is sitting with Sanji. They're trying to fish. And Luffy is very impatient, which is unsurprising. Sanji is extremely philosophical 
about the whole thing. Sometimes they bite right away. Sometimes it takes ages. Sometimes you don't catch anything at all. And he's wearing a pretty chunky silver ring on, it looks like the middle finger of his right hand. And I don't recall if this is anything significant or, you know, even if it's meant to be something significant on the show yet in terms of like, is it just a costume choice? I don't know. But uh, I just wanted to mention that I noticed it because it, I couldn't see from this far away what it looked like, but it was pretty sizable. And I sort of wondered if maybe it was like something to remind him of Zeph or the Baratier or, you know, anything like that. I don't know. Um, and kiddos, I have got to just say one more time. Sanji could get it. Like, a few times. This gentleman has got something going on. And it's like, I want that to not be true because of his like, oh, women are all a mystery. Women don't say what they actually mean later this episode because that's just some bullshit. However, also, it mixed in with that kind of like, misogynistic take there is him being able to sense there's more to the story and he's right about that so he has better judgment despite these like cliche sort of the here's the thing the whole idea of women don't say what they mean the reason that is like still bandied about is because for a long time women were not allowed to say what they meant we were punished quite frequently and by a variety of parties for saying what we actually meant. So we had to learn how to gauge the audience we were speaking to and the possible consequences of what we were saying and be extremely passive in the way that we said it. So that's an issue. And secondly, we often do just say what we mean and men don't want to hear it. And so they just don't. And then they act surprised. This is often a thing when women decide that they want a divorce and the men will be like, well, this came out of nowhere. If you look at the documentation, Your Honor, it was said many times that she was getting fed up. And it's also funny because like men will just tell you fucking lies all the time. The, the number of things like I'm, I really feel good about, at least with Owen and Brendan, I never had lies from them almost ever. And they, there's a reason that I stayed with them because the lies that you get fed by dudes, they, they may have a totally different motivation in not saying what they mean, but it's still like, uh, they still do it. So anyway, all that to say, as much as it bugs me that he bandies those kinds of bullshit takes about, I really can't be mad at the results, which are that he tends to look below the surface and sort of try and suss out what's that there's something actually going on. And later on, when we get the story about what happened to Nami and her sister, he's the one that's like trying not to sniffle in the corner because he's gotten quite emotional listening to the tale. So all of that in his favor, combined with the fact that he can cook, combined with the just like easy grace, there's a, just a vibe and an elegance to him. It's just really doing it for me. It just really is. So mm, I'm sorry, Zoro. I'm going to have to backseat you. And I never thought that would happen, but there you are. Um, but yeah, he says to Luffy at this point, but we're not talking about fishy ar fishing, are we? And uh, Luffy says, I just wish I knew Nami was okay. To which Sanji says, a beautiful, talented woman does not choose to ally herself with a pirate like Arlong. Nar Nami clearly needs to be rescued. And this is when Zoro comes up and says her tattoo says different. Tattoos don't tell the whole story. And like any woman, she's a mystery. Nami made her choice. You don't know why. <laughs> the only thing I want to hear from you are dinner specials. 
I really enjoy the two of them. Like, we finally get to Sanji calling Zoro Mosshead. I'm into it. Just and, and I like that this like conflict between the two of them, it feels because, you know, I have no problem with the petty conflicts that they have later. It's quite entertaining. But this moment, because it's the Nami that they are angry about, each of them in their own ways, it feels very organic because with Zoro, there's a specific thing going on with him where for me, what's happening is that he's actually angry at the fact that he grew to like Nami and he trusted Nami. And then to find out that she was with the Arlong pirates, you know, he made an exception joining this crew because even though he has had a whole thing against pirates, Luffy felt like a different kind of pirate. But then to find out that Nami isn't a different kind of pirate, she's the exact type that he has been going after. It's a betrayal and it's him seeing things in a very black and white way. It's almost like he is so cynical that when the hint that she is act, like part of the Arlong crew is dropped, it's, I say hint, but you know, he is fully willing to go whole hog into, oh yeah, she was lying, she was conning us. Because he has seen a lot of bad shit and is willing to see the worst in people. Like it's not hard for him to believe at all. But with Sanji, he loves women. He is much more like interested in defending her. I am going to go ahead and hazard a guess because she is a woman. So there's just that intrinsic sort of bias that he has. But then the fact that, uh, you know, he, because he wasn't personally betrayed, that he isn't as close to the situation as Zoro was, it would make sense that he's more willing to offer up some benefit of the doubt because he's not hurt by her. You know, this isn't, this isn't hitting him where he lives. So he can step back and have a slightly more objective approach. And it just makes sense the way that each of them is just kind of sniping at each other. Um, so this is when Usopp yells land ho. And, uh, I always love when they say land ho and everybody turns. This is not just the show. Everybody turns and they're like a hundred yards away from an Island. And it's like, you the, the point of the yelling land ho is because you see it long before anybody on the deck would see it. Like you're on the, you know, in the crow's nest or whatever, or because other people aren't paying attention. But this is like a giant area that there's no way they would have missed it. It was just very funny to me. Um, but yeah, so we cut from there. We have, that's the cold open. And I just wanted to mention, you know, every time that we have one of those cold opens, we get a uh, different Jolly Roger. And this one is, it has like two curls coming out from behind it, uh, like almost like cinnamon roll style curls. Its tongue is sticking out and it has a winky eye and stripy blue and white kerchief. I can't figure out what this is in reference to you guys, because it's not Nami. At first I thought it was Buggy because he's just such a goober, but it doesn't work for him either. And I mean, it's not Nami's sister. I don't think certainly not one of Arlong's guys. Like it just doesn't, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm missing something here. Um, so if anybody wants to help me out with that, but anyway, so we, uh, after we see the title card, we get Nami as a child. This little girl is so like looks so much like her and uh, she uh, reminds me a lot of like a you know Kirsten Dunst when she was in interview with a vampire but she, we have her you know as a child playing with her adoptive sister and they are in the tangerine groves and they are out here with their uh, adoptive mother whose name I always forget it's like uh Belmere I feel like and she, Belmare, maybe, and they're playing Snap in the garden. Uh, and it's a very sweet scene. Like the whole vibe here is really warm and loving and friendly. 
and they don't have money, you know, they're struggling, but you really do see how much she loves these girls and how there is a home here. And I just really, really like this moment. So let me come back into the present and Nami is playing poker with the fishmen. And she is up against this dude who's got a couple stripes down his face. There's a very Polly Walnuts sort of energy to him. Uh, there's just like every, all of these guys, the really, it feels like they are designed to look like a combination of a fish and like a Dick Tracy villain. You know what I'm saying? And uh, she provokes this one fish man that he really like looks around to everybody as she makes a joke that he can't count higher than five. He looks around and he goes all in and it really feels like he just fell directly into her trap. Like this is exactly what she was trying to get him to do. And uh, he loses. And when she wins, he calls her a cheat. There is no evidence that I know of. He seems to just be like a sore loser. But we then see her walking away and she does have other queen cards in her bag. She was cheating. Now, I'm really curious whether or not he knew for a fact if it was just the fact that, like, was he kind of counting cards? Like, did he know how, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is what I really want to know is, was he just being a sore loser? Because he may as, he may very well have simply been pissy and wound up right by accident. But I am curious, like, if he had good reason to think. Um, so he accuses her, she uses her knife, and... She just says, you should know that nobody in this crew lies about money. And there's a long face down between the two of them. And finally, he lets go of her and she gets summoned by Arlong and she goes to see him. And he sends her on a mission to go and get the payment from the people of Coco Island or Coco Village. Uh, they are on the same island because they have failed to pay up. They are late on their payment. And then when she finally goes to collect, they don't have the whole thing. And this is, I found her acting like in this part, I feel like, so here's the thing. I'm going to, I'm going to say that I understand at the same time. I find her acting to be a little bit, like one note sometimes, but I also understand that the point with Nami a lot is that she's keeping it inside and trying to like keep a lid on her actual emotions because she can't let things show. So it's a very like difficult line to walk because this is what happened as well with uh, Daenerys in Game of Thrones. In the book, she talks about keeping her face placid but you at least get to see inside her interior mind and understand how many emotions she's experiencing and how difficult certain moments are for her, despite not being able to show. And in the television show, it was a lot harder because she just had to keep a straight face so often that it wound up becoming almost tedious since she was attempting to convey I am keeping a straight face, but also there's a ton of emotion behind my face and I have to let that show somehow in my eyes, but only in my eyes. It can't come out anywhere else. And that's a really difficult thing to pull off as an actor. And I think that they both are able to pull it off, but I do also think that having that be something that goes on for such a long time can feel to one note, like I said, too tedious. So 
I was sort of relieved when we get to the end of this episode and she has her breakdown because we got to see a different side of her that was truly like so upset in a way that she has not allowed herself to be. And I just felt relief for the actress and I'm sure that it was nice for her as well to get a moment where she's like able to just let loose for a second, you know? Um, and I also want to mention that, uh, I, after I finished the episode, I wanted to see the moment that Luffy puts his hat on Nami in the anime again. I went and found the clip on YouTube and, uh, she's wearing the exact, like, green, it's not like, the you know, it's designed differently here. It's not strappy the way that that is, um, but she has the same sort of overall outfit and once we get to that scene it's like shot for shot with the anime it's really really similar so anyway she gets sent on this mission to our by our long and she's super pissed about it and we get another flashback of her as a little girl looking through this map book and her mother belmere i'm saying mother you know it is that's the whole point is that she considers herself their mother um she asks Nami where she got it and Nami has to admit that she stole it from the bookstore and tries to justify it by saying that she didn't hurt anyone. And Belmere is like, I, you hurt the people who stole it. Why would you do that? And she says, because I wanted it. And this little actress, I thought pulled this off quite well because she says, because I wanted it. And there's a certain like snottiness to it. But you can also see the fear, like she's being preemptively defiant. And so the snottiness, there's sort of like something that kind of undercuts it a little bit. And she just says, I didn't have any money. I am tired of being poor. I'm tired of eating tangerines. I'm tired of eating Nojiko's hand-me-downs. Uh, and this is like something that I can deeply relate to. And Belmare says, we may not have much, but we have a roof over our heads and we love each other. That's what makes us a family. And she says, no, we're not a real family. She's not my sister and you're not even my mom. And Nojiko slaps her across the face. And I had forgotten that she does, she does that in the anime as well. And Nami goes running up out of there. And I thought maybe they would have, Belmere, I, I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. I think Belmere, um, that they would have her like apologize to Nami for hitting her. I was wondering if they would, because in the anime, she doesn't, it's supposed to be like, she meant what she did because it was so offensive to her what Nami said, but I kind of wondered if the, the, live action, they would sort of pull back a little bit and try and be like, oh, we're going to acknowledge that like slapping a little kid in the face was not the move, you know? They don't though. They just go ahead and roll past it into her story and her telling Nami, I kept a stove, a plate on the stove for you. And I kind of, a part of me like appreciated that even though I don't like that she hit Nami. I also like the fact that the show isn't particularly trying to change that part of Belmere's personality. Um, but yeah, so this is when we get the flashback and she's telling Nami about how she was injured and she was starving and she wandered into this area where there had been an attack and she thought she was going to die and she found Nami and Nojiko under, I think it's like an overturned wagon or something. The two of them are hiding under there. And she says, the moment I saw the two of you, I knew I had to live so that I could take care of you. And we are a family. Like, you know, it comes down to her being like, don't you ever fucking forget it. And I know that you will do the right thing. And when we come back to this flashback later, Nami is giving the book back. To, she's giving it to the uh, sort of cop. I don't even know. I don't remember what his name is, but we'll deal with that scene later. 
Um, Arlong's vibe with Nami. This actor who plays Arlong, I went and like looked up what he looks like. First of all, he fine as hell, which is unsurprising. And secondly, I feel like he really is excellent at managing that weird, unsettling energy of I'm pretending to be friendly, but I'm not friend. I'm not your friend. And I have a distinct understanding of the hierarchy I'm working with here. So there's a, a sense of him like telling her over and over different scenes to relax, to have fun. And to, and he says things like, I really missed you. And, you know, it's like, he wants to be chummy, but it feels like he is only ever actually saying this because he knows how uncomfortable it makes her. Like he would never approach a different person who actually wanted to be in the inner circle the same way because the whole thing is about power and making her feel like she's off kilter and unbalanced. So, you know, you, you've approached different people in different ways to make them feel really uncertain about where they stand with you. And with her, this sort of like false intimacy, it's just, he, he does it so well where I find myself almost wishing she would relax, just have a drink, just be cool for a second. And then I have to remind myself, like the instant she did that, he would find something to fuck with her because the whole point of this isn't that he wants her to relax. Like that's the opposite of it. Um, but yeah, anyway, he comes in and he says, uh, you should be proud of yourself. Now we know every Marine base and stronghold from here to the Goa kingdom. And you're a valued member of this crew. We make a great team. You were gone so long. Part of me thought you might not be coming back. And she says, of course I came back. We have a deal, don't we? And he says, yeah, I'm a fishman of my word, but he ain't. He ain't that, though. So she hands over the map in this you know, big moment here where it seems like maybe she's going to fuck with him. And he says, soon fishmen will rule the East blue and then on to the grand line and every other sea after that. And we have more talk this episode, not here, but in general about the way that fishmen have been enslaved. And I wish that if they were going to kind of, keep harping on about this aspect of the way he like wants retribution that we had gotten to see more of what he meant or get an example. It feels like because the only time that we have ever seen a fishman other than him was the Mater D, I think at the uh, Baratier who is not being mistreated. It doesn't seem like there's, he's a slave. It seems like that's just his job. There's not a really good sense of what it is that he's upset about. You can understand it in like a, you know, the, the broad strokes of it as a hypothetical, but it doesn't have an um, emotional hit because we haven't gotten a look at this trade and what he's talking about. It almost could feel like, he's exaggerating things if you didn't know for sure. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, he says, uh, that Marines can be bought and sold when an animal gets too wild, it must be brought to heal. And he does like, he's sort of holding her chin with the map tube. And he says, you'll have a special place in my empire. And Nami says, I'd better. And he starts laughing and says, oh, Nami, how I've missed you. But I have another job for you in the meantime. And this is when he like tells her to go to Coco Village and get the money. And it's obvious 
her being like, I'd better. He has to show her her place, remind her that she doesn't get to throw attitude at him because she's going to be like sent to do something distasteful as punishment. So we then jump over to the Baratier and uh, we've got Garp turning up and asking Zeph if he has seen Luffy. And he knows him by the name Red Leg Zeph. He was captain of the Cook Pirates. And Zeph says, yeah, well, those days are far behind me. I'm retired. I'm a chef now. And the only thing under my command is this restaurant. Uh, but yeah, he's being kind of, you know, defensive right out of the gate. Because understandably, he is assuming that they are here for him. And Garp has to be like, no, no, no. We're here for a young pirate named Luffy, who was here recently. And Zeph does the whole, hmm, I'm afraid I can't help you. I, uh, I don't have such a great memory. You know, I'm growing old. And they're like, straw hat, running his mouth. Nope, drawing a blank. And then, how about a meal on the house? I've got a dozen T-bone steaks and a busted cooler. It'd be such a shame to let all that delicious marbling go to waste and i love as he says this you guys if you're watching like really closely the wistful longing that comes into garp's eyes as zeph says this it's like nami with a mention of treasure it's just so it's comedic it's so good and bogart starts to say we're not here for a meal. We're here. And Garp interrupts and says that steak. And you could see like his mouth is already watering. And Zeph says medium rare. And he nods and says more rare than medium. And that's how the episode or the uh, scene cuts off. And later on, when we see him, he's eating with this just hedonistic appreciation that got me right in the heart. I love to see people enjoying food. And it's like, it, I, I it, this, I mean this in terms of, I like to see it because I love food and I imagine eating it. And it's like entertainment in that way. But also I love to cook and I love that seeing like people appreciating what I have made. And it, this has been a bone of contention with me and Owen a couple of times because I will make this meal that takes forever and I've put so much effort into it and I'm really hoping he likes it and I'm not sure if he will. And Owen doesn't get too flowery with like saying that he likes something. So he'll just put his head down and inhale a whole bowl of it in seven minutes and then I have to be like, so how was it? And he'll be like, oh, it was really good. But he will never give any indication of really enjoying it while he's eating it. And I always have to ask because he's just not effusive, you know? So whenever I come across somebody who does what I do, which is like take a bite and just go, oh my God, that's good. Like, thank you. Appreciate you. Um, so we go back to uh, Coco Village and we've got the boys arriving and looking around at all of these huts and how much has been destroyed. And they come across one particular hut that's been literally yanked up out of the ground so that there's just a, like, hole underneath it. And they're all looking at it like, what the hell could even have done that? And I love Usopp immediately being like, maybe, uh, maybe I should head back to the to the, you know, the, the ship and just, like, make sure everything's cool with the Mary. And as they keep walking, he's like, or, uh, you know, I, I could go back and, like, take the Mary around if, if we don't want to walk back the whole way. It's, he's got some good lines here. Um, Buggy in the bag. Hey, shithead, I think we can all agree that Arlong's a bad fish, but why don't we quit lollygagging and go get my body back? <laughs> Sanji uh, I think asks Usopp do you want to carry him for a while 
And Usopp says, oh, no, new guy carries the clown head. And later on, Sanji stuffs a tangerine in his mouth and says, new guy shuts up the clown head. So then we go to the scene where the whole village is attempting to put together enough money to pay the fine that they have to pay, the tribute, whatever. And they put it together and the dude with the mustache is saying it's not enough. And this woman says, do we have time to get some more? And you just hear Nami say, no, you don't. And I love, she walks through, everybody here is dressed in these very drab, like even clothing that had used to be brightly colored is so coated in dirt. It's all basically the same, like brown and uh, she walks forward and comes face to face with her sister, who is grown now. And Luffy almost steps in, but I think it's uh, Zoro who stops him and is just like, just observe. And her sister spits at her feet and is just like, you are so full of shit. I am disgusted by you and walks away from her. I love the tattoos she's got. They look so cool. She just looks dope. Like, you know, and she does in the, in the anime as well. She had one of the cooler character designs for a woman because so many of the women look the same in the show. Um, so, yeah, she stalks off and you see Luffy sort of taking note that there must be a special relationship between the two of them because everyone else is acting afraid of Nami except for that girl. And, that you know, then this girl spat and left like there's something specific happening here. And we then have Nami saying to mustache man do you have something for me and we then jump into a flashback of him saying that to her and she is returning the book she stole and uh you know assuring him that she will never steal again but when he she does this he says do you have your fingers crossed behind your back and she says maybe which was a cute moment um but yeah, he's got a good energy. I like this guy, you know, in the anime as well. He had, he was, he was uh, a voice of reason. Mr. Genzo. Okay. There, she just said it. But uh, I feel like this actor was a really good choice for it because he has the feeling of somebody who could be a hard ass if pushed, but he doesn't like to do it. So this is when Arlong and his people show up and they just begin to beat the hell out of everyone and he says, citizens of Coco Village, this town belongs to me. And they all flee. And Mr. Genzo goes forward and gets his ass handed to him by a fish man. He, like, is disarmed with almost no effort. And uh, that is where he sustains the injury that has scarred his face. And Arlong is indeed... The man who just yanked an entire house up by the roots, basically. So, Belmer flees with uh, with Nami, and she hides them in the. I, I I hesitate to call it a basement because it feels like it's not used for anything. It feels like it's purely there for hiding and not for storage. But she keeps them down there, and we have that scene where Arlong comes in, demands a certain amount of money, which she has. And he starts to leave until he notices that there are two other places set at the table, even though there's no registration of family living at this address. Apparently they have that info. I don't know where they got it. There must be some central like a sort of town hall that has info and they were looking through that but um yeah she he the moment where he notices that this actor just infuses the moment with so much dread it's just very very creepy and you want so much for him to just leave you know um so before we get there we have luffy facing off with nami and her telling him I conned you into getting the map for me. I was never part of your stupid crew. And he says, you don't mean that. And when he says that, you see her just get so frustrated because it's, she could act in the moment like she's frustrated because she wants him to believe her so bad. 
because she she thinks she means it, but you know that it's that she's frustrated that he can see through enough to tell that she doesn't mean it. You know, she is trying to protect him. That's genuinely her motivation here is to keep him away because she feels like she will hurt him. And if she doesn't, Arlong will. And so it's up to her to get him to hit the road. But uh, just knowing that he is able to sort of read her more than she wants to be read, that's where the frustration is really coming from. So she walks away and it leaves those uh, four boys standing there discussing what's actually going on here. Usopp is like, that went really, really badly. Should we just go back to the boat? And Sanji says, there's something else going on here. She was, you know, like, I don't like this. Zoro's like, I mean, she made it pretty clear. She just wants us to leave. And this is when Sanji says, you know, women, they never say what they mean. Don't you guys get it? She's one of them. She's a bad guy. The villagers are terrified of her. And this is when Luffy says, not all of them. And he decides that he is going to go and talk to the blue haired girl. I love that he just says, hey, scar guy. <laughs> and understandably, as he introduces himself as I'm a pirate, Zoro feels the need to intervene and say, hunter, pirate hunter. And explain, we're here for Arlong, which uh, he understandably doesn't think these four have got any fucking chance. They look like a pretty ragtag bunch. Let's, you know, it's it's weird. We've got a couple guys in sort of Hawaiian-ish shirts. Sure, one of them has a weapon and he seems the one that's able to handle himself most. But then we've got this scrawny kid that looks unarmed in a hat. We've got a dude in a suit who does not really give the energy off of like a fighter exactly. He's, you know, clearly well built, but also unarmed. And then we've got Usopp in the back, not making eye contact and trying to be as small as possible and not draw any attention and just generally cowering. And uh, yeah, the whole thing is, is not looking like these are people who stand a chance up against Arlong. Um, so yeah, he gives them the name of Najiko and says down the road to the, down the road to the edge of the tangerine grove. And, uh, I just sort of wondered if that rang a bell for Zoro because, you know, she did mention the tangerine grow grove. So when they get there, she's got a weapon, does not want to talk to them. And it finally, like, they are able to negotiate because Sanji is charming. He is the guy who is smoothing the way. And uh, he says, well, we want to know what happened. And if you would like, I could make you something to eat. And she's like, we don't have many ingredients. And he says, you could be surprised what I could do with just a few things. And later on, when she eats it, she tells him what he made is the most delicious thing she's ever eaten. I love to when she says, my sister doesn't have any friends. And he says, sisters make sense. Both as beautiful as each other. <laughs> He's uh, very reliable. But, you know, he is the one that seems to warm her up. When he says, how about a meal? you really get a, a response out of her that indicates that this is a person who doesn't reliably have meals. You know, she's got just about what she needs to survive and that's kind of it. Um, so yeah, this little bit and the way that he like worms his way in, I just really enjoyed it. And honestly, this girl is so beautiful. Like, Every time that she's on camera, I was like, somebody needs to just sculpt her or something. You could make her face into one of those like Barbie heads that you would put makeup on. Do you know, guys know the ones I mean where it's just like the shoulders coming out of the plank or whatever? Um, but she, she would be like so much fun if you were a makeup artist to do makeup on because she's just got one of those faces that's 
it's got so much character to it, but is so flawless. Oh, beautiful, beautiful girl. Um, so yeah, we then head over to the Baratier again. This is the moment where we get to see Garp eating. I can't remember who it is. I feel like, uh, it might've been, what's his face? Um, oh no, it's not. It's Bogart who says, this is nothing. You should see him in a curry house. That's right. Because we've got uh, Kobe and Helmeppo off to the side watching and just sort of like, it, you get the feeling that maybe this is the 11th steak he's eaten. I don't think it is, but you know what I mean? There's like a sense of, we've been watching this guy chow down for a while now. Um, a curry sounds so good to me right now. Oh my God, that sounds so good. So we then have Zeph come and open a bottle of wine. And what he tries to do is distract Garp by chit-chatting about fishing and about cooking and everything else. But it never actually works. And what it comes down to is a moment where Zeph tells him, you're not going to stop him. And he's too, like, he's grown. There comes a point where you just have to let go and let them make their own decisions. And, of course, Garp is not at all interested in this advice. But he says, you know, he's a special kid. They're, it's their time. There's a new generation. And you've got to give them room to breathe. And it's an interesting tack to take because, like, being like, oh, this kid, you know, he is a pirate. This is what he wants to do. Just let him live his dream, whatever. That is really the way we've approached it in the script mostly. And to have Zeph kind of just say, you know, we're the old fogies and it's time for us to sort of step aside and let them do their thing. It makes sense considering the reasoning he gave behind being willing to eat his own leg instead of like taking any food away from Sanji that he was like looking at Sanji as somebody who was going to go on to live the dream that he had imagined for himself. So being interested in like letting the new generation take the reins actually makes a lot of sense. But um, Garp is just not hearing it. And meanwhile, Kobe and Helmeppo are off to have a drink. They're not supposed to because they're on duty, but Helmeppo is just having Kobe like loosen up a little bit, which I don't think is actually a bad thing. There are times where somebody is like, you know, oh, lighten up, buddy. And it's they're clearly just a very bad influence getting a person to do things against their better judgment. But with Kobe, it feels like he could stand to loosen up a little, like maybe they, he is a bit too rigid. You know, it's not like as somebody who has anxiety and often likes to follow the rules, I can get a little bit too hide bound. And I like the fact that he has a couple shots, but it doesn't like it doesn't feel like he tells Helmeppo about Garp's relationship with Luffy because he's drunk. He has those shots in quick succession and then says it immediately. He hasn't had a chance to get drunk. So it doesn't feel like Helmeppo's recommendation of loosening up is leading him down a bad path or anything. It seems like he's in control still, but he is just relaxing his standards a drop, which isn't always bad. Um, but yeah, when he, uh, is talking to Helmeppo about it and he's like, uh, that's his grandson. Helmeppo's like, wow, that is super not what I thought you were going to say. But all right, I mean, the kid with the straw hat and him. And then the bartender is like, straw hat kid. Oh, yeah, we had him here because apparently the, the memo has not gone out to the staff to not say shit about this kid. It should have. I'm a little disappointed in you, Zeph, for not making certain that everybody was on the same page here. But uh, they get the info they need, and this leads to Garp telling everybody to get ready to head out 
for the islands and you see Zeph kind of panicking a little because like he was really hoping they were just gonna not know where to head and we could sort of end things here but they got the info from somewhere and I wonder if he knew who it was if they would be punished for it or not but okay so let's go back to uh Arlong's area we got this like kind of weird carnival area where there's like games and stuff and there's a bar that has a big sign that says shark attack and uh f what's his name fish mouth is like drinking booze and spitting out in and doing one of those like kind of fire breathing type things it's funny because the way that he ex the way that he shoots the the booze out it's like bullets almost it's really weird um but i thought it looked cool oh sorry no the bar is named it says ghost train so it's got like the parts of a carnival but it's not actually like there's a ride in there anymore i wonder what this is supposed to be was this meant to be like a tourist attraction that they repurposed or were they because like it you know what I'm saying, you guys? It doesn't actually look like this was a carnival and they like invaded and made it into something else. It looks like it was already being used for something else and they just happened to have shown up. Uh, the part where Arlong is set up with his chair like a throne, it looks like it used to be an area for like a merry-go-round, maybe something like that. Um, so this is when Nami comes in to give him the tribute that she was able to collect, but it wasn't the full thing. And there's an explosion and it's a weird, like, I think somebody maybe just fired a gun to get his attention because I thought it was going to signal the beginning of an attack, but instead it's that rat faced Marine who's being paid off by Arlong. And in this scene, he demands more money than they agreed to. But later on, after being threatened, some is willing to settle for what was originally agreed. Uh, so this, we, we then go into the flashback with Arlong and Belmare. And as soon as she is threatened, Nami and her sister bust out of the like hiding place under the floor and Nami is saying to her, why didn't you just lie? Just tell him. And she says, because you are my daughters and I will never deny that. And I felt like you guys remember probably if you listen to my coverage of the anime, how frustrated I was with this scene because I felt like her death was so preventable and I was, there was a real sense that if she had lied, then she would have been spared. But I like the way this scene is done better because you really feel like whether or not she said, I have two daughters, Arlong was going to find them and he was going to make her pay either way. So, her choosing not to deny her daughters, it is easier for me to stomach because it felt like she was screwed either way and she knew it and she just decided to do the thing in the moment that was like just and and good for her daughters, like in an abstract way. Um, whereas in the anime... I really felt like she should have lied because it seemed like if she had things would have gone a different way. There isn't that sense in the scene in the live action. It feels like things would have gone this way, whether she lied or not. So she may as well make sure to say the truth before she's killed. Whereas the anime, I was just sort of like, it feels like she's just putting the principle above being there for her daughters, like choosing to state, yes, they are my daughters and putting that on more of a pedestal than actually continuing to live and care for them, which I feel like is objectively much more important 
than whether or not you deny them to a pirate king who has you at gunpoint. Like, it, I just, I, I really, it was obvious from the way that uh, everybody was reacting to the episode in the chat. And I think I did a joint with Gabby on that one. I think that Gabby joined me that most people were really affected by this, but I just found myself annoyed and I was glad to see that here they, they managed to like really nail the, the situation and make it feel like ultimately she was going down either way. And it was just the way she went down that she was going to get to choose. So yeah, she says to Arlong, is this enough to pay for my two girls? And he says, do you know what you're saying? And he, she's like, yeah, I fucking do. And so after she tells them both to be good, she's sorry she wasn't a better mother. She stands up and turns to him and he just shoots her in the chest and she goes down. We don't actually see her get shot. The last thing she says is, I love you girls. And when we come back to the present, even Arlong says about her, she was brave. I will give her that. And yeah, this is uh, when we come to the present in the moment with uh, the crew being told this story, Sanji is uh, sniffling and teary eyed and just trying to cover it up a little bit. And I just really like that aspect of it. I feel like they're giving them all like especially Sanji though Sanji's getting more characterization than the others and Zoro I understand that um a friend of mine said that some people felt he was a little bit too flat the actor it has been working for me um but I could see what they mean especially in contrast to the way that Sanji feels like already pretty he just feels a little bit more interesting as a character than Zoro does. Um, so at this point, Luffy stands up and he looks really confused and it, I, I couldn't tell. I think that the thing that is happening here is that he has heard something so terrible about Nami working for the guy who did this to this girl and Nami herself that he feels as if this is the confirmation he needed that maybe Nami is not a good person like he kept trying to believe and it's a shame because like you know you want him to maintain hope but there is a sense of like maybe I was wrong as he gets up and goes outside and eventually he says something like, I'm tired of hearing about Nami from other people, but it takes a little bit to get there. He's outside for a bit here with, uh, with Zoro. And the first thing he says is she was just a kid, but Zoro is not willing to let her off the hook and is like, dude, she's a grown woman now and she has made her choice. She's doing what she do. Um, she told you to leave Luffy and Luffy looks at Zoro and says, so did you. And follows this up with, I know she's not one of our longs crew the same way that I knew you weren't going to kill me when I cut you down from that cross. And the same way that I knew about Usopp and Sanji, I just know that she's good. And we get the scene of her when she's little going up to Arlong and asking to join the crew and this deal that they wind up making. She shows him the map that she has made and he is genuinely impressed by it. He's like, oh shit, you can see it must be very hard to act when you've got so much makeup on. But you can really see like the admiration on his face and the fact that he's like, all right then, she's fucking something. There's a... Uh, an interesting situation here, actually. Um, and he says, I killed your mother and now you want to come work for me? And he stands over her. I love how huge he looks. 
why would you do that? Because you have something I want. And she says, I told Arlong I'd work for him on one condition that he let me buy back Coco Village. And he said he would if I could get a hundred million berry. This is all happening because she's digging up the treasure that she buried at their mom's grave and her sister stumbled across it. So she's finally telling her the whole situation here and is telling her in the middle of it, like I have the money and now I can buy the freedom of the village and everybody in it. And then of course, because Arlong had told her at sunrise, bring me the money. And I thought it was like, you know, I had forgotten exactly how this went, but when he says, bring me the money at sunrise. And I was like, that's too much time. If somebody gives you this kind of like deadline and it feels like there's a little bit too much wiggle room, it's because they want time to do something on their end. And this is when that fucking rat face Marine comes around the corner and is like, oh, well, 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 look at all of this stolen shit. I think I'm going to have to confiscate this. And Nami's acting as they steal all of it. I mean, she is so good here at just being absolutely desperate, like completely losing her mind. And it's very clear that Arlong put them up to this. She knows that's what happened. Like there's no doubt in her mind. And, uh, when we have a speech from Arlong about how the fishmen are the superior beings, which is actually a pretty solid speech. Sometimes these kinds of characters with their speechifying, it can feel a little bit eye rolly and tedious, but he's really, really riveting to watch. So I felt like this was actually well done. And this is when Nami begins to scream Arlong and stab herself in the arm. And it's just so like, guys, I like recoiled from the screen when she started to do this. It was really bad. Um, and her hand gets stopped by Luffy. And this is the point where things begin to be almost shot for shot, like in the anime. And he's holding her hand and she says, I told you to get the hell out of here. And he says, you did. And she says, you don't know anything that's going on here. And he says, I don't. And his, like the whole expression that he has here, he is just waiting for her to explain. He is so trusting that there is more to this story and that he wants, you know what I mean? Like the whole thing. And she finally says, Luffy, help me. And he says, of course I will. And he takes his hat off and puts it on her head. And he says, of course I will louder. And then yells, of course I will to the skies as he like does a fist pump, a double fist pump. And it's a, uh, it's interesting because like in the sub, which I watched right after this episode, I, he's when he does the like fist to the sky moment, the sub says that he says, damn right, which I actually kind of prefer to, of course I will a little bit, but I also understand why they had, why they changed it here, you know, cause it doesn't quite feel like Luffy for the way they've set up his character in the show. So he walks away from her very slowly. It's a great bit in the dark, you know, on this like little stretch of road. And as he's walking away, the camera pulls back and we see Sanji smoking. We see Zoro lounging with his sword. I think he's sitting on the edge of uh, a, like a stone wall and Usopp sort of curled in on himself sitting on the ground. And Luffy says, let's go. And they all say right at the same time, straight out of the anime the characters in the same panels in it, same thing. And they look up and they see all this fire 
and they realize that Arlong has already started to attack the village. And that is the end of the episode. So the next one, guys, next one. And that's the end of season one. And I'm so sad. All right, I got to wrap. Thank you guys again so much for listening. Gabby, thank you for commissioning. Hope you're enjoying. Until next time, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.